the best of the week on Relevant Radio. Big day. Let's talk angels. I know we've all had our own encounters. I would think maybe somebody you know has encountered theirs and the hour of death went off of their scene. Maybe they've encountered them in a moment of crisis and they've been saved. I've invited to join me today Dr. Mark Mervalli, longtime friend of the show. You know him. He teaches at Ave Maria University and Franciscan University. He actually teaches a course on angels, and uh, he joins us today to answer your calls, your questions, and those mysteries you might have about the angelic. Doctor, welcome back. Good to have you here today. Thank you, Drew. It's always a pleasure. We have to start with an awe of the angels. Now, mm. true, it's hard for us to have awe, to, to really kind of pull back and to just have a sense of something really supernatural. But imagine this, Drew. Imagine if there was a civilization under us that basically, although well-intended, just ignored us for a good part of their lifetime. And, and we would be saying, now, wait a minute, we are created on a higher level than you kind of subhuman things. Of course, these don't exist, but bear with me. But that's what we do with the angels. Uh, and the angels are higher. They're a civilization. There's as many angels in the ninth choir, Drew, as every human that's ever been and every human that will be. Angels don't recycle. Angels don't generate. And so this is so far beyond the wonders of, of Tolkien fiction. This is a massive angelic civilization of beings as perfect as you can be and still be created that we do in our weakness. And this is not a guilt thing. It's just kind of a reality a reminder that these are the, these beings that are there both to adore God and as, you know, the quote from St. Augustine said, as messages for us. So St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, says God seeks to do everything through his angels, that, that the angels are, quote, God's secondary cause. That means every way he can delegate, he delegates to the angels whenever possible. So that's why we've got choirs and hierarchies and angels, are like the virtues that change the seasons and that rotate the sun and the moon and angels that, you know, lead uh, nationalities like principalities and thrones who just stand before the face of God and adore. I mean, truth, there's so much we need to learn from the angels, let alone the lowest level, which is our guardian angel. We really have to, you know, have a communication with it. How do you get to know your guardian angel? And, and the answer is kind of simple, Drew. It's, well, how did you get a relationship with any other person? Through communication, right? Through talking. God is obviously in a different category, but for all other created persons, you have to communicate. And sometimes, like even with, with saints, you have to start talking to them, even though you know you're not going to get an answer. That's okay, because they're there, and they're persons, and they want us to respond to their existence. And we've been given each uh, an individual angel, you know, beings beyond us, to guide us home. So really, Drew, it's not about the past. It's about right now. It's about today. It's about this Feast of the Guardian Angels. It's time to meet our guardian angel, and it's time to start conversing. Don't feel silly if you start talking to a created person that God gave you. So like your case, Drew, specifically, God gave you your guardian angel. Should you hesitate to, you know, talk to him and, and share your feel? Well, of course not. That's just confirming the gift that God has given to you. And that's, that's true for all of us. So let's really make today a launching day, a, a starting path for a deeper communication with our angel that eventually will lead to love. And, and that's, that's the kind of friendship we want to have with our guardian angels. Let's go back in time, too, if we could, Doctor. Remember before time, or however you want to look at it, the creation of the angels. Where were they? How did the fall come about? Because we've got these angelic creatures that were put to a great test. Let's talk about the fall. I mean, what do we know about it? How was it revealed? Maybe talk about the, the order of creation, if you could. Sure. Well, the Fourth Lateran Council back in the 13th century established that God created at the same time creation, that is, things like the earth, and the angels, and then at a later time, it could, it could have been a moment later, but slightly later, human beings. 
So that means that with the creation of the universe and the cosmos was also the creation of the angels. Now, in terms of their moral testing, Drew, and, and you know, just to be very clear, the Church doesn't teach definitively on this, but the greatest commentators, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, St. Dionysius, Gregory the Great, they all have a general consensus that before the angels received the beatific vision, and the reason we have to specify that, Drew, is because, yeah, they're in heaven, but they're not saved in heaven yet. Why? Because they're persons, and God respects their free choice. So God tests them with something. Well, what's the something? Most agree that it was the revelation of the future incarnation of the Word becoming flesh. That sometime in the future, God the Son would take on a human nature. Now, this infuriated Lucifer, who was arguably of the highest, if not the highest, angel. Why? Because Lucifer said, non servium, I will not serve a God-man. I don't want to serve a creature or even a God connected with a, a creaturely nature that's undermined. In fact, many commentators think that Satan uh, thought, well, if you're going to take on a, a creaturely nature, I'm going to take on an angel's nature. But don't take on a human nature, and therefore I as an angel have to lower myself and adore a God-man? I won't do it. And that's the famous reference of Revelations 12, where you know a third of the stars are taken with the dragon upon earth and ultimately to hell. So, But there's one angel that cries out, who is like unto God? Well, that's literally the meaning of Mikael in Hebrew, uh, meaning that very question, who is like unto God? In other words, who dare refuse the will of God? And that was St. Michael. And so St. Michael becomes the host, the leader of the heavenly host in the great battle against Satan. So the majority of the angels said yes to the great plan of the Incarnation. And it's also interesting, Drew, that many commentators say that when it was revealed that the angels would also have to venerate as the mother of this God-man, as their queen, Mary, that's when Satan really lost it, so to speak. So I'm I'm not worshiping a God-man. I'm certainly not going to take a human being as my queen. And that's where you see the beginning of the great battle between God's greatest creature, our, our sweet mother, and God's most heinous creature, Satan. So it all starts with the angels. The great Genesis 3.15 of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. Well, it didn't start there, Drew. It started with the great revelation of the incarnation and Satan's rejection of Jesus in the future and also of Mary. And that's the great testing of the angels. My guest, as I said, Dr. Mark Mervalli, we'll take a few calls for you. Triple eight nine one four nine one four nine. We'll start in Park Ridge, Illinois. Uh, Mark, good afternoon. You're on the air with Dr. Mervalli. Dr. Mervalli, how do we know the things we know about angels? I, I was the question was triggered by what you said about the number of angels in the ninth choir, and I'm certainly not a scripture scholar, so I don't know if it's all scriptural. Like, but my question is, what's the origin of the knowledge that we have? Yeah, great question, Mark. So the essentials which the Church teaches on is contained in Scripture and tradition, so all the seats. So, for example, St. Paul will make reference to all nine of the choirs. But in terms of things like what I just discussed in terms of the tempting, that comes, as I mentioned, that's a consensus of the great three commentators. And that, again, is is St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, and Pseudo-Dionysius, the 6th century author, He has a work called The Celestial Hierarchies, Uh, and Pope Gregory the Great took elements uh, even before this, you know, would constitute really kind of a small T tradition, but the general order of what the Church teaches, certainly what's in the Catechism, uh, what was read earlier, that's from Scripture and the principal commentary of the Fathers, and then it becomes doctrine as soon as, you know, the Popes do so, and that's, for example, the reality of guardian angels. That's that's a truth of a doctrine that's been confirmed by the papal magisterium based on Scripture and the Father. So it's really those dimensions. But I stick to at least what is the common consensus of the theologians, the Fathers, the Medievals, uh, and then, of course, the other specific elements that are confirmed by the papal magisterium. I hope that helped, Mark. Great. Thanks, brother. They're really a civilization, if you think about it. I mean, it's uh, 
It's an amazing thought. I, I often contemplate, uh, you know, Padre Pio said if you could see the, the amount of demons that were in the world, it would block out the sun. And I, I just think of how many fallen angels have, you know, have been cast out. And it's impossible, I guess, for us to know. But in, in terms of numbers, I mean, is there any way to even get a grasp on the angelic realm? The biblical term is myriads. <laughs> and I think Miriam really translates into you know, clearly billions. Why? Because there's 8 billion people alive now. Right. And that means there's at least, you know, 8 billion angels. And, you know, uh, I think in, in an earlier question, too, it's kind of like, well, how do we know the guardian angels come from the ninth choir? Right. That's a consensus. It doesn't mean they're exclusively from the ninth choir, but, but at least there's a guardian angel for every single human being. So how many billions of people have there been? How many billions will there be? And that's all just the lowest level. So civilization is almost British understatement. Right, too. I mean, right. it, there's such massive, many mystical writings talk about how there are thousands of angels in every single Catholic church when the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is being offered. So it, it's kind of like God is using yeah. quantity to bespeak this beautiful, glorious quality of, of these angels uh, that we are called to call friends and, and to imitate. St. Faustina, when she would drive past the church, ride past the church, she would see angels dedicated to each one of those churches, right? She'd see these mm -hmm. angelic beings guarding them. We know when the Fatima apparitions, the angel of Portugal appeared to the seers. Do churches, do nations, do particular missions get special assignment? Are angels assigned to them? I mean, Maggie was saying in my headset as I was talking there that what about radio stations or apostolates like Relevant Radio? Are there special <laughs> angels that are given? Well, I think the principle is that radio host leaders, they don't get one, but assistants <laughs> like Maggie, they always do. I well, think that's thanks, that's doctor. Right. Maggie is an there angel. There you go, Maggie. Maggie and you I didn't are even have angel. you on the headset either. <laughs> huh? that's not bad. So classically, from the principalities, which is the, um, the, the seventh choir, right? So let's just briefly mention the choirs. So we have seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. That's the highest hierarchy, the, the first three, and they are focused on adoring God. Then we have the dominions, the virtues, and the powers. That's the middle hierarchy. They're concerned overall with the governance of the universe. But it's that third high hierarchy, Drew, it, it's the principalities, the archangels and the angels, they're the ones focused on us, on human activity. So it is commonly accepted that principalities are, are, are princes uh, that are really assigned to leadership of countries and nations. Uh, St. Thomas held, held that it's principalities that affect a shift of power. So if, not to get political here, but if we want a, a power shift in our, in our country, it's good that we would pray to the guardian angel or the, even the principality of the United States. Yeah. So short answer is yes, angels are in charge of human operations, but for major power shifts, it's yeah. principalities and it's archangels. Yeah. And do, I once heard a priest get assigned more than one archangel or more than one angel, I should say. Is that true? It's certainly possible that based on one's vocation, one could need more angelic assistance and protection. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, and again, we're in the realm mm -hmm. of speculation, so we, we have to you know, be clear about that, but the idea that you know, the Holy Father would only have one guardian angel in light of his massive task and the massive attack coming after him, uh, I think would be unfounded. Uh, certainly the Holy Father right. would have more than one angel it's very uh, possible that uh, even a bishop would have more than an angel. But typically it's, it's articulated this way, again, in speculation that there's still the guardian angel, but then there's also almost a, a vocational angel that's given to uh, people with important roles uh, for the church and the world. The idea that there wasn't some form of angelic and saintly intercession, I think, uh, would be naive. I mean, that this is clearly an answer to yeah. prayer, and again, even if we don't have these extraordinary cases, it should encourage us to be grateful every day for the angels who protect us both spiritually and physically oftentimes. And, and let's once again, just let's clear up bad theology. Um, you know, people love that Christmas classic, 
But human beings, I hear it all the time. Oh, you know, my my child died. She's an angel in heaven. Not literally, right? I mean, you have to, you know, human beings will never become angels. That's correct. Uh, angels are angels. Humans are humans. Angels, again, are created spiritual persons without bodies by their definition. Right. Now, of course, if parents are saying it metaphorically, right. my, my little right. sweet right. one, right. but in terms of changing nature, no, that God does that. Uh, he establishes our nature, and that's what we will always have. I only got a couple seconds. Who has a higher place in heaven, angels or human beings since God became man? Uh, I, I love uh, both too much to get into that one, Drew. Oh, I can oh. say on a created level, angels are higher. Okay. Uh, man who participates in grace, that's great. But what about the angel who participates in grace? Right. Anyway, let's love them all and, and, and rejoice in this great day. Doctor, thanks for being with us today. It's always great to talk with you. My pleasure, Drew. God bless. It's Dr. Mark Miravalli. I'm out of time for the day. May God bless you. Hey, like what you just heard? Then share it with your family and friends. And thanks for listening.